This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. We're happy to be doing life in the law today. We want to examine the mm, practice life, the professional life of Dick Sutton, who is with um, Sakai Iwanaga Sutton Law Group right here at Walkaway. Welcome to the show, Dick. Well, I'm glad to be here this morning. We, we met, uh, we, we know each other for years and years. In fact, I remember attending your house up in Uwano. Your dad was the president of the Federal Bar Association, and he invited all the federal, I was a federal lawyer at the time. He invited a fellow named Moreau, who was the Coast Guard commander of the district. And it, I don't know why, but I always remember that meeting in your house. Huh. <laughs> yeah, well, that's where I grew up. Up in Uwana, that's right. Yeah. So uh, somewhere along the line in Uwana, you decided that you wanted to go to Stanford, and ultimately, oh, I'm sorry, Princeton. Undergrad. Then Stanford. Okay. <laughs> right. Princeton is not easy. It's a special experience. Some say it's a lifelong fundraising experience. <laughs> how did how did you decide to do that, and how did you do that? Well, I mean, it, it was kind of. Um, a decision that got done in high school, of course. Um, my father had been both a Stanford undergrad and Stanford lawyer, and so I was sort of headed in that direction to begin with. But then um, we, at Punahou, uh, there were a number of recent Princeton grads who taught us courses, and they were trying to attract us to apply to Princeton. And so I said, ah, I'll go ahead and apply. <laughs> so when I got in, uh, they said, oh, you got to go. And I said, well, you got to talk to my dad. <laughs> so eventually, um, I was able to convince them to go there. And, and I thought of it would, would be a more exciting experience to go all the way to the East Coast than to uh, the West Coast, which I had visited several times. And it would turn out to be uh, yeah, a, a pretty challenging experience. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a great school. It's a world-class school. But you know what? I, I read recently that, that uh, Princeton has changed. Um, Princeton is now more open. It's more diverse. Do, have you seen that? Uh, yes. Um, well, when I went there, it was still an all boys, all male school. So it didn't turn co-ed till 1970. I graduated in 67. So co-ed was a big step to begin with. And then, of course, after that, there has been an, an extreme effort to have uh, a diversity there. And, uh, you know, so when we go back there for reunions now, when you see the more recent classes, you know, they look more like uh, high schools in Hawaii <laughs> than they right. do in... Uh, That's great, yeah. Uh, and, they, and they give scholarships to uh, minorities? They give scholarships need-based. Actually, you know, they don't give athletic scholarships and they don't give merit scholarships. It's all need. And if you have the need, they can pay. And uh, so they don't have loans, they have grants. Mm -hmm. So essentially, um, you know, you establish a need and, uh, you know, they'll take care of it. I remember now, I think it was on 60 Minutes or one of those news shows on, um, on television where there was a, an article, a, a feature story about how um, the, the current president of Princeton had really opened the place up. Well, it's been a process over a number of years, um, uh, you know, and they've uh, have been... Uh, you know, making a special effort. Uh, out here, I mean, just one of the results we had, we got our first um, student in from Farrington that we ever got a couple years ago. I mean, we try to get students in from different islands and all different uh, backgrounds and stuff. It's hard to uh, kind of find those nuggets so they will apply. Uh -huh. That's the big part. You're part of the recruiting effort. Yes. You're I, connected <laughs> with the school. They don't I, let you go so easily. <laughs> <laughs> well, we interview every applicant, uh -huh. and uh, so I've been interviewing um, applicants to Princeton since I got back here in the early 70s, wow. so it's uh, good they, fun. They, uh, they reach out to you for contributions, because I know other Princeton graduates, and they are um, regular contributors. Well, uh, actually, uh, the, one of the main features about Princeton in the U.S. News and World Report about giving is the percentage of alumni that give every year, not the amount, the percentage. Yes. And it's 67%. Wow. With, and the next highest one is like 40%. Wow. And uh, so that's, it isn't, uh, yeah, so I mean, they, you make a point of trying to give something every year. I mean, what they do is have you contribute to your class based on the, the numeral of your class. So mine is 67, so they want me to give at least $67. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And of course, uh, anything else is, is uh, better. And um, then, uh, of course, when you have a big reunion year, which you have every five years, you know, they want you to give more, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you, got, you went from there to Stanford. I mean, these are both great schools. Stanford is the Harvard of the West Coast. Some say it's the Harvard, period. Um, it's a very good school. Um, why that one? Uh, did you enjoy it? Um, <laughs> well, anybody ever enjoys <laughs> law school? <laughs> um, well, I mean, the, the interesting thing was my father went to Stanford Law School following uh, World War II. He uh, was a Navy officer, and so he went back, and he went there from 40, 1947 to 50, and I was born in 45. So he started out with two kids and ended up with three. So he bought a little house near Stanford, and he kept that place. And so when it was coming time for me to decide on law schools, and I, I, I knew that there was this place I could stay at in Stanford off campus, you know, that was a big draw. That's great, yeah. yeah. So I stayed there for the three years at law school. Oh, that's great. That's an incentive for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, otherwise, you know, living on campus would have been, uh, well, it would have been, you know, a different experience. So tell us about how you decided and at what point you decided, for what reasons you decided you wanted to focus on litigation here in these islands. Well, um, I mean, I, I started out in law school, um, you know, not knowing exactly what area I would practice in. Uh, Stanford isn't uh, a school that necessarily trains any people for any particular specialty other than the way I look at it is they think once you graduate, you're going to then sit on the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> That's a so, nice thought. <laughs> so so there's, a, there's a quick jump from one uh, the, uh, the school right up to that uh, highest level. But um, uh, since I um, had an ROTC obligation following college, um, I knew I was going to go back oh, in the those military. Those were the days of the draft, it was, wasn't it? But, yeah. Well, I... Uh, and Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. And so I was able to... Um, get commissioned as an officer while at Princeton, and then they let me go through law school, and I practiced for a year. But what I had uh, was unsure of is whether a law firm would take me back after I went into the service. Yeah. So I applied to law firms in Honolulu, and uh, uh, went to work for my first, uh, after my second year in the summer, for a firm called then Henshaw, Conroy, and Hamilton. I remember that firm. And, uh, I remember you being there. Yeah, and, and so I went there, and I thought I was going to become um, a condominium lawyer, because uh, Dwight Rush was the senior condominium lawyer in town, or one of them, and I had done a, uh, a study in law school about the financing of condominiums, and so I thought, well, you know, I can fit into this. But then I met up with the litigators in the law firm, and it was uh, Wayne Sakai, um, Mike McCarthy were the main ones, and, and they just had a barrel of fun. So it was, you know, something that kind of appealed to me. <laughs> okay, right. This is going to be in a final exam. Litigation can be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you worked your way into that. I mean, it became a specialty after a while. And then you developed subspecialties within litigation. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that um, well, we got really involved in trying cases right away because we didn't have no fault then. So we went to trial over a thousand dollar dispute on a lot on an auto case. Defense. Defense. Yeah, I did almost exclusively defense work. And so we went to trial and you got a lot of experience with jury trials by trying those cases. And so then I got more into specializing into um, um, malpractice cases. Um, I did aviation litigation defense and uh, I guess commercial litigation of all uh, varieties. That's an interesting array of things. So, I mean, aviation, take aviation. It, it's a very exotic field because there aren't that many issues around aviation, I, I guess, and you don't have that many crashes, uh, for example. And so, is it because you decide one morning that you want to read up on aviation litigation law, or is it because somebody comes in and says, Dick, um, I, you know, I have a case and I'd like you to steep yourself in aviation law. Well, we had, I guess, Willie Moore in the firm had been doing some uh, aircraft litigation. And the, the big um, breakthrough for me was uh, <clears throat> when they had the Aloha incident on the plane that was flying from the oh, Big Island to Maui. The plane came half off. the plane came off. And a, and a flight attendant was, was lost. Yeah. So uh, what happened is the insurance company out of New York uh, contacted our firm and so I was put in contact with that person, and so I ended up defending uh, Aloha Airlines, 
the, not, the, not the passengers' claims, but the dispute that was uh, potential between Aloha Airlines and Boeing. Mm. Again, defense. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, I mean those, that, all that matter got resolved without ever going to court, but yes. it was um, very interesting. Uh, well, that's the best thing, certainly, for the, for the airline, um, because a jury might not be sympathetic. Yeah. Well, there was a big effort by the bar to try to prevent any of the plaintiff's lawyers from um, uh, trying to uh, not uh, look towards resolving the cases. You know, somebody, that, you know, they were, uh, the, the Chief Justice even got involved and, and uh, got all the lawyers to get together, and, and so we got it resolved. Yeah, that's great. Well, that's a, sort of a civility thing, or uh, let's make peace kind of thing. Maybe it's a Hawaii culture point. A lot of this is driven by Hawaii culture, isn't it? Yes. I mean, there's a big difference between the cordiality of Hawaii lawyers, both plaintiff and defense, than there is in the big cities on the mainland. The big cities on the mainland, they figure they will never come across their, the lawyer who's opposite them again, so they will try you know, everything they can to offend, destroy, and, you know... Scorched win. earth. Scorched earth. Yeah. And, uh, but the lawyers in Hawaii uh, still have a cordiality. So it's still fun? Uh, it's, uh, I'm not doing it as much now because I'm sort of easing out of uh, practice, but uh, it was uh, fun because it was sort of like an athletic event. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, speaking of athletic events, we're going to take a moment for a break and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about athletic events and how that all relates to your professional career. Good. That's Dick Sutton. We'll be right back. Okay. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger. And hungry mornings make tired days. Grumpy days. Bleh kind of days. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Hi, I'm Dave Stevens, the uh, host of Cyber Underground, uh, every Friday here at 1 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. And then every episode is uploaded to the Cyber Underground, that library of shows that you can see of mine on youtube.com. And uh, I hope you'll join us here every Friday. We have some topical discussions about why security matters and what could scare the absolute bejesus out of you if you just try to watch my show all the way through. Hope to see you next time on the Cyber Underground. Stay safe. Okay, we're back with Dick Sutton. He's, uh, I guess he's a litigation lawyer, but he's got another side to his life. And, uh, and this, all, this all kind of emerged out of the stress of litigation, maybe? Because somewhere along the line, you got into athletic activity running specifically. And I remember years and years, I used to see you run, uh, even in the days when I ran <laughs> a long time ago. So talk about it. Well, um, when I, when I came back from uh, law school, the running boom was just starting. This was in the early 70s. And um, I went down and watched my first Honolulu Marathon back in about 74. I saw this 12-year-old kid do a two hours and 54 minute marathon, thinking, wow, wow, wow. That's, that must be really easy if a kid <laughs> can run a marathon like that. So I joined up the Honolulu Marathon Clinic and I ran and went through all the pains you go through in uh, adjusting your body to running. And so I ran my first marathon in 75 and I think I did a, about a three and a half hour one. And then I found out that running was really good when you're practicing law because you could run in the morning and the evening, you didn't have to go schedule a tennis court or golf course yeah. or anything like that, you could go run. So I started running more and more and I got better and better at it. So uh, eventually um, I got down to two hours and 46 minute marathon in um, about 1980 and then I got That's also world class actually. It, well, I would have finished twentieth in this year's marathon. Wow! Wow! <laughs> so wow. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was good. I, yeah, I was sort of th thinking like maybe I could uh, stop practicing law and just run all the time. But that no, that's <laughs> a real thought. <laughs> but there were too yeah, many other people. You don't make a lot of money doing running. No, no, <laughs> there, there were a lot of other people ahead of me. So I got um, involved through the Honolulu Marathon because I was running it with the people who were involved with it. Actually, our law firm at the time had uh, been involved. They, they were the ones who did the documents for the original marathon 
and uh, some of them, I guess a guy named Bill Strickland and Sue Strickland I remember him were more involved. Sure. And then uh, I became the lawyer for the marathon back in the early 80s and still fill that role. Um, and so I deal with uh, everything from insurance or matters where people get injured or dealings with um, sponsors or other kinds of uh, matters like that. Mm -hmm. Can you talk for a minute about the evolution of the Honolulu Marathon? Uh, yes, I mean, the, the Honolulu Marathon um, was uh, something that Frank Fossey actually was spearheaded. Um, he uh, saw that there were uh, marathons developing elsewhere, elsewhere and uh, they wanted Honolulu to be at the forefront. So he um, <clears throat> did all the permitting, assisted with the permitting, and I think initially uh, he had the police officers work for the marathon without getting compensated um, by the marathon. It would be by the city. And so the first marathon got put on, I think it was about 1973. <laughs> and so we just had our 46 uh, oh, Honolulu Marathon. <laughs> and uh, so it was the kind of thing that uh, um, kind of became popular among the local runners to begin with. And uh, of course the, the big jump was when uh, Dr. Jim Barrowhall got involved and uh, through his ingenuity uh, got the um, support of uh, Japan Airlines and other people in Japan who then uh, developed a lot of interest in coming to Hawaii to run the marathon. There was another doctor too. Dr. Scaff. Dr. Dr. Scaff. He sat in that seat uh, a year or two ago. Uh, he was about his experience. His health is not that good. No. He, well, he was, he was involved for a while and then there was a break. And I, was, I wasn't involved when Dr. Scaff was involved. I got involved after that. Uh -huh. So there was a sort of a break off. But he, he certainly was quite instrumental in, um, I guess, the, the main thing is I remember going to the clinics that he would um, uh, have a lot of his patients who were cardiac patients uh -huh. involved. And so the idea was that running was good for you. Although when I'm talking to my uh, running friends now, I mean, they break down just like anybody else. <laughs> so it, it doesn't necessarily... Uh, cure everything. No, but it helps you. It helps you um, in stress. It gives you endorphins or something. Uh, it, it makes your life a little better, just psychologically. No. Yeah, I mean it. Uh, it really does um, uh, relax you better than uh, going out and having a drink or certainly <laughs> or some other sources. I, I guess the the thing I found most interesting, in addition to uh, building up um, uh, the ability to uh, you know endure all the stress of uh, trial work, was a lot of my running friends were non-lawyers. And so you had an opportunity to try your theories out with these other guys before you did it in front of a jury. It's really helpful, isn't it? Yeah, because uh, essentially if you talk to other lawyers about your theories, they'll have their theories. But I sort of figured out lawyers had all the common sense trained out of them. <laughs> You want to talk to John Q. Everyman and get <laughs> yeah. and his feedback on it. Yeah, so it was very helpful uh, with my the guys I'd be running with, and I sort of explained the case to them and explained my my point of view and and sort of asked them what they thought of it. So it gives you a good feedback without having to have a mock jury. Yeah, that's great. So you've been running all these years. Well, I, I ran um, pretty much regularly until about nineteen or till about two thousand seven, about or uh, ten years ago. When I was out jogging one Sunday, I fell uh, and uh, put my arms out, braced myself, but my uh, right knee hit and cracked my right kneecap. So I had to have that uh, wired up, and that sort of uh, uh, you know, kept me from running for quite a while. And so when I started again, I didn't have quite the same determination. Yeah, pain? Not the pain so much. It's just that uh, it's really hard to get back into good competitive running shape. Yeah. Uh, just uh, with if you take time off. Yeah, 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 and, and yeah. You're and you don't want to hurt yourself again. No, but but one other part I got involved in uh, with running is um, with track and field. Um, I wasn't ever a, a runner in high school or college, but my kids got involved, and I got involved in administering and coaching their club, and then I got involved with um, USA Track and Field, which is the governing body for track and field. And so I was president of the organization for about 20 years. On the mainland? Uh, over here. I was okay. president of the local association. And then I uh, got into officiating. And uh, so now I'm the uh, head official or chief official for the state of Hawaii. And it's sort of like being a, a judge, you know. But uh, <laughs> uh, so, so you have rules and you have to figure out what the 
how to apply the rules and uh, what um, is the result. And uh, so that's kind of fun too. Yeah, it's a whole, it's a continuum. You run yourself, you get committed to that, you know, you help your own life that way. And then you help other people and become officials and official in these organizations. And then you're helping a lot of people and, and you're actually bringing the community together around this activity. It's just, this is a great contribution you've made, and you're still making it. Yeah, it's well, and it's it works both ways. I mean, it does, um, and and because I have to work with officials on all the islands, you know, you get to meet all these nice uh, people on the other islands, and uh, <clears throat> we get to go to those islands for uh, for meets and uh, you know get work with them. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a very rewarding thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, the hard part is though is um, to get more people who are interested in in uh, becoming officials. So if anybody uh, out there is interested in becoming official, you can contact me. Yeah, that's well, that's great. What a great way to spend time. What a great way to help kids, actually. But what about running in general? You know, there are activities that you and I used to see, like, for example, music and orchestras and all that, um, the arts, um, that, that are not as popular because other things, like, take our time. Uh, and they take the time of the kids um, and regular people. And so I'm wondering, is running as popular as it was in the 70s when the marathon was sort of gaining, gaining speed, gaining force, gaining, you know, being a magnet for everybody in all places in the world, uh, or is it on the decline? Well, I think, um, you know, the amount of um, people uh, coming into marathoning is going down. I mean, we really have seen uh, a lot less competitiveness uh, at the top levels among uh, non-elite athletes. There's a lot of competitive among elite. But what we've done with the marathon is we have two other events now that are shorter. One is a 10K, which is, of course, 10 kilometers, 6.2 miles. And the other is a half marathon, which is 13.1 miles. And so we have uh, tried to reach out for people who may not want to do the marathon or do you know, another event. So that's become more popular. Mm. So you're still running? I mean, I, still, I know not competitively, but... Yeah, I go, I go out and run or jog with my friends uh, uh, a couple times a week and uh, try to keep uh, myself uh, moving. That's well, the main thing. Well, that sounds central to your, you know, your life, actually. I mean, the thing about it, what I get here is that it started, you were lucky to connect up to it and, and find solace and nourishment in it, you know, and, and it has more and more defined your life. And it had taken, you know, more of your effort, more of your dedication all the time. And now you're, you know, approaching retirement, I guess. Uh, maybe that's on a slow bell, but you're approaching retirement and this fits neatly in your life. Yes. Um, there's no limit on the age that you can officiate. There's no limit on the age that you can still run. I mean, this uh, past marathon, this past Sunday, and an 88-year-old from Japan finished in 17 hours. <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's real determination. And it really um, sets a, a goal for saying, you know, you shouldn't sort of uh, just stop because you're aging. Are you traveling around running? Are you to go to other marathons elsewhere? Do you officiate elsewhere? I do mostly officiating. I just got back uh, from the USA tra Track and Field uh, annual meeting in Columbus, Ohio, and then I'm uh, lining up uh, a couple of meets on the mainland to go officiate uh, this summer. I've officiated at, uh, I guess, Junior Olympic National Championships, uh, World Masters Championships, <clears throat> and some other uh, open competition on the mainland. Mm. And how did the marathon go just last Sunday, the night? It went very well. I mean, uh, we had... Um, First, we had, we had sort of a combination of three events. On Saturday, we had a mile race in Waikiki, which uh, uh, had about 2,000 competitors. It's a warm-up kind of race. Well, it, I mean, those milers are really specialized. They, don't, they, they run a mile fast. They don't want to go out and do okay. a full marathon. Um, and then uh, on Sunday, in, com in concert with the Hello Marathon, we also had what we call Start to Park, which is a 10K that goes from the start of the marathon to Kapiolani Park. So some people don't want to full, run the full marathon, they can do that. So we had about, I guess, maybe over 30,000 total registrants. Well, that's huge. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, is that that's top? I mean, is, is that... Yeah, I think we're the fourth largest marathon in the U.S. I mean, we've had more people uh, run or register in the past, but we're quite pleased that we're still having big numbers come out here. 
I think it's an important part of Hawaii's image. You know, that we, so many people come, that, that we, we do it so well, we organize it so well, everybody has a good experience. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of image we want to put out. Well, definitely. And I guess the, the interesting thing is that this has been done by the sort of same group of, of people for a long time, and it doesn't, we don't have government uh, involvement or assistance. Um, and so, you know, we've been able to work well with a very streamlined group. What are your challenges in putting it together? Ah, uh, weather is... <laughs> <laughs> Including <It's>, temperature. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, we had one year it was really hot. We had rain at times. Uh, those are some of the big challenges. Uh, a, another big challenge we face is um, that since we have to, since we have wheelchairs in the race along with runners, we have to accommodate it to make sure the wheelchairs and runners don't run into each other. Yeah. And over Diamond Head, which I had been handling, we have to separate the two lanes of road with like 200 people standing in the middle of the road holding a caution tape so the runners stay on one side and the wheelchairs and the elite runners and their vehicles come back on the other. So that's oh, a challenge. Complex. And I guess once in a while you have injuries, you have accidents. Once in a while you have serious injuries yes, and accidents. Uh, I mean, it's just like any other small city uh, you know, of, of 30,000 people, uh, except these people are moving around. We have a lot of medical support. Um, we uh, have become more advanced in, in the medical care of the uh, people who are injured right away. Um, and so, uh, I mean, this past weekend was nice because the temperature wasn't so high as to give people a lot of heat exhaustion. Yeah, and it didn't rain. No, it didn't rain. It rained a lot on Saturday, but it got clear for Sunday, so we really... Divinely <laughs> inspired. Yeah. So as general counsel, I'm really curious, you know, because general counsel has to field a lot of balls. Um, how, what kind of experience is it to be general counsel? What kind of matters come up that you have to handle? Well, one of the first ones that came up that resulted in this um, accommodation of wheelchairs was the same day of the race was way back, I, I guess, in the, the mid-'80s when we used to have the wheelchair and any wheeled vehicle on Saturday. So they had their whole course separate. themselves and separate. Yeah. So the, the wheelchair people, though, uh, went to the Department of Justice and said, ah, Americans with Disability Act. Oh, no. <laughs> and said, this is a place of a public accommodation. <laughs> That's a challenge. <laughs> and so <clears throat> the, the, the city came to us and said, you know, um, we're going we're gonna to lose federal funding unless you let the wheelchairs in. <laughs> so we, I had to deal with uh, then the Corporation Council, and we worked out something that uh, became out the way, you know, the way it is now. That Including was, the separate lanes. Separate lanes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, so that was one of the biggest deals. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's um, things um, that involve, you know, when somebody gets injured. One year we had a... And another thing I was thinking about that we had, we used to have a pasta feeding party, a, a carbo loading party. I remember that on and, a Saturday night Saturday before night, the marathon. marathon. Yeah. Well, one time the, the salad got contaminated with salmonella. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day we had a lot of people who uh, they weren't feeling so good. They couldn't do a good race. <laughs> no. And so there were a number of claims that came from that. Oh. And so we had to deal with that. And that, that sort of was helpful that I was already a defense attorney, so I knew I, I didn't handle the defense. I always turned it over to the insurance company who had somebody else handle it. Yeah. But we were able to kind of uh, keep um, that moving along. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there was a synergy here. I mean, to be uh, a lawyer, a defense lawyer especially, and to be um, involved in the marathon, that really helps you to, not, aside from the legal issues per se, it's just that, a kind of level of understanding about how this kind of thing works legally uh, will help a lot. Yeah, I mean, a marathon is a business. Um, it also has, um, <clears throat> you know, certain, well, it's governed by the USA track and field long distance running rules, which I'm also familiar with. <laughs> so, um, it, you know, it, it, it isn't like it just makes up its own rules. There's rules that apply to marathons. Uh -huh. So uh, we're almost out of time. I, I want to ask you to um, try to have some influence on those kids out there who might want to go to law school or not. Uh, and also those kids, this is sort of a combined question, if you don't mind, um, also those kids who, who might want to run. I mean, who aren't in it now or who do run and want to go further and become an, uh, an official. Um, 
who knows what, you know, in organizing running events? Well, um, actually, running in high school, including, I guess, intermediate school in Hawaii, is the, has the most number of participants of any sport. I mean, when we run uh, cross-country meets in the fall, we may have, um, <clears throat> in, in each of six events, we may have 200 kids running in each of the six events. So we get a lot of kids running, and that's a good way to get started because um, running um, it really is, is a sort of a non-cut sport. Not until you get right up to the championships, you know, do they start to uh, cut the people. So you can get involved that you way. Participate a long time. You participate. Yeah. And, and once you get started in high school and do it then, you can do it in college, you can do it beyond that. There's uh, programs for masters, uh, competition, and then these long uh, road race uh, road racing things, anybody can go participate in those. So the idea is to get started that way. The other thing I sort of find from my position uh, as a running, in running and officiating, is a lot of smart kids run. Very, you know, the ones who aren't very athletic, but they're smart, because running is, is something that they can do. So that's a recruiting ground for me for looking for kids who might apply to the schools I look at. Mostly you compete against yourself. Yeah. It's your own experience. Right. And so um, um, it's, it, it, mostly it's not winning or losing, it's just finishing. And yeah, and just um, getting the satisfaction of uh, having done something and participating in something. Being an athlete. Yeah. It's wonderful to be an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it's uh, something that's really now um, schools have really looked at as being part of education. Is Athletic, education through athletics is, a, is one of the mottos they have. So is running in, in the schools here in Hawaii, is running part of uh, PE uh, or is it sort of extracurricular? The competition is extracurricular. Um, when, you be, when you join a, a cross-country team or become part of a track team and specialize in an event, that's, that's uh, com competitive. Uh, PE has different types of activities that involve running, but it isn't just track related. Mm -hmm. So how do you see yourself, uh, I do want to come to, back to the advice to kids about going to law school and all that, but how do you see yourself uh, evolving in this? Are you going to spend more time in the organizational sense? Um, how do you see your years to come? Well, um, I, yeah, I mean, I see that I uh, will continue to uh, work with officials and try to keep it organized. I, I guess the, the important thing I'm always looking out for is a successor, because the guy I took over with from, that was what he always told me, train your successor. You know, find somebody willing to Good advice. To, yeah, kind of uh, take over. Don't, don't try to oppose him. You know, if you find one of those guys, encourage him. Enable him, yeah. <laughs> Enable him. Find one yet? No, I, <laughs> not, not somebody who's, you know, maybe somebody to take over some of the specific disciplines, but you know, the whole big picture is kind of tough. Yeah. But, um, so if you think you could qualify, <laughs> To be Dick Sutton's successor, contact him. Yeah, he's I, I, easy to find. He's in the book. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I mean it's uh, it, and it, it's actually um, something you can continue to do, you know, until you get uh, your health problems get in uh, the way. That's true. I, I know a lawyer out of Gibson Dunn, an old buddy of mine for ever, um, and when he stopped practicing, uh, he he was he went into soccer. And he, he's an official now in the, you know, the AYSO, uh -huh. and um, he's, he's been, you know, active in the in national soccer org organizations for years. That's how he's dedicated his time. Well, in addition to going to the mainland or other places to officiate, I go see these big international meets. I've been to about the last five world championships. I went to the Olympics in Beijing, and I've signed up to go to the one in Tokyo. Oh, All right. a spectator, though. I, I, yeah, okay. I don't get to officiate, and I don't get to participate. But, but because of your, um, you know, act, your, your, your participation in other ways, when you go to a running event, it must be really a great experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like you try to, you know most of the people who are going to be competing in it. You know their backgrounds. You get all the information on it. And... Uh, and then I bring my stopwatches, all my, oh, sure. my, my rules, and all my books with me. Who is me. that my, guy with my, the stopwatch? <laughs> my camera, and, uh, and, and so it's, uh, yeah, so it's a real involved kind of an event when you uh, attend one of those things. Yeah, that's great. So back to my earlier question, that is, what's your advice to kids who might be considering law school? You know, certainly it's changed since uh, you graduated Stanford, certainly, and, and practiced here. That was the early 70s. 
Lord knows the practice of law has changed dramatically in these years. What's your advice to the young uh, aspiring lawyer? Uh, and well, I guess, um, the, the, I guess one of the things is to try to get some understanding of what it's about before you get into it, uh, which is kind of tough, but uh, perhaps you can go uh, um, either in, in some way uh, call up a lawyer. I mean, you can call me up and I'll talk to you about it. Thank you. Um, the, the other, th because it's a huge commitment of time and expense uh, to find out that there wasn't something you really wanted to do. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I was sort of interesting. I, I came, my father was a lawyer, my grandfather was a lawyer, his father was a lawyer, but my father told me, don't become a lawyer. So I became a lawyer. <laughs> so, um, but, but uh, I think uh, the idea is to sort of figure out is what are the various uh, uh, disciplines or specialties you can practice in so that what might interest you. Uh, not every lawyer goes to court. In fact, most don't. In fact, most don't like to go to trials in, in the courtroom. And it takes a, a lot of kind of, um, uh, I guess, practice to be able to uh, get good at it. Um, but there's always a need for good lawyers. So the idea is if, if you think you're uh, you know, really interested in it and you're doing really well in school, you know, that's the time when you should look at law school. Yeah. To add a point, lawyers uh, facilitate our society. They have a duty to our democracy. Um, and they are very important, and these days you see that more and more. Well, one of the things that they sort of mentioned in law school, or I'm not sure they use the term quite that way, but it, sort of social engineers. In other words, we clean up the messes. A lot of messes that are made by other people, lawyers help clean it up. They help prevent it by um, doing contracts and ordering, private ordering of things. Uh, <clears throat> they also uh, advance uh, for people who are otherwise not able to uh, kind of have their say in, in the process. Access. Access. Justice. Yes. Thank you, Dick. Dick Sutton, lawyer, runner, all around good citizen. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jay. Good to be here. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.